Following tonight's screening of the General Magic movie, we'll be hosting a special panel discussion with uh, General Magic co-founders, um, Bill Atkinson, Mark Pratt, and of course, Andy Hertzfeld, as well as with um, General Magic alums, Megan Smith and Michael Stern. So you won't want to miss that. Now I'd like to introduce the moderator for this evening, our panel discussion, our CEO and President, Dana Lewin. He began here in March of this year after a distinguished career at many uh, companies, including Microsoft, Next, and Apple. And it's a true pleasure to work closely with him here as he's leading the museum for its new phase of growth. Please join in with me in welcoming Dana Lewin. Uh, thank you. Uh, what, a, what a pleasure. This is the first opportunity I've had to moderate a program here at the museum, and I couldn't be more pleased to be doing it with some friends. And it is our pleasure to be hosting the General Magic screening tonight. As you all know, um, like most startups in Silicon Valley, it failed. But unlike most startups in Silicon Valley, they pioneered so many things that are ever present in our lives today. So um, I hope you watch the movie with a personal eye as well as a historical eye. I think there's a lot to be learned. I'm excited to see it. It'll be my first viewing as well. So tonight, um, our hope is that you'll take a look at what the magicians did and again, put it in your personal context. The museum is really proud to have helped and contributed some of the artifacts and act action for the movie, um, the old Apple Newton videos, some of the early General Magic event recordings, as well as some live conversations that were filmed here at the museum with Tony Fidel and others who were part of the team going way, way back into the late 1990s. Before we start the, the uh, film, though, I'd like to introduce the producers, Michael Stern and director Sarah Karouche, if they'll join me on the stage. Thank you. I'm so pleased that you could all be here tonight. It's a huge thrill for Mike and I. This film started with a, a conversation. I was in Italy, and I just read Walter Isaacson's book, and I was going through it saying, I know these people. <laughs> and I started to think about the story, this incredible company that we'd worked at, and how the original interpretation of events, that this was a company that failed, had turned into something completely different, a, a redemption, and a, a team of people who changed life as we know it. And it was that moment when I called Mike and said, hey, Mike, we should make a film about this. And he, was, and he said, I said, well, sure, we have all this great archival footage. Why don't we make a home movie for the magicians? <laughs> and Sarah and I met in a dingy bar in Soho a couple of months later. And over time, it became clear that we had more than that and a, and a better thing to do than that. And thanks to Sarah and her, her incredibly talented and wonderful crew, uh, we have the movie that you're about to see. And I would just say that for me, this is a very personal journey. I think that's probably no one in this room who hasn't experienced failure, whether it's the failure of an idea that you're trying to bring to life or you know, in some aspect of your life, something you've aspired to do. And I think that failure is sugar-coated in the valley, but for me, it's it's eviscerating when you fail, it's so painful, and yet it's so important if you learn the lessons and then you go on to do whatever is next. And it maybe isn't the thing that you imagine in the first place, maybe it's something completely different. Um, but I would just say stay with it because General Magic is a really good example of some people who went through an incredible journey and an excruciating failure, but so many amazing things came from that. And I, I hope that's the legacy of the movie and I hope you enjoy it. Yes, thanks for being and here. And here it is, thank you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to spend a little time uh, chatting here a little bit and see if we can draw them out of their shells here. <laughs> you know, one of the things that this reminds me of is the, the reality, and I think we have to all hand it to Mark on this one, that um, when you bring a collection of people together, um, the hardest part is keeping them together, and they're all here. Uh, <laughs> And that's, that's a real testament to the, the fact that I think when people work together so closely and you all witnessed it in this film, there's this inevitability of them bumping up against each other constantly. And it's like a rock tumbler where people change as a result of it, but uh, at the end, I think they're all 
better for it, and we're all better for what they've done. So I'm really very emotional to watch that. You guys did a great job. I thought I'd start um, with Bill, because I had a little chat with him um, earlier, and I just wanted to ask him what he remembers most from a personal perspective, um, watching the film, and sort of what, what surfaces for you personally at the moment, right now. Uh, well, this is the second time I've seen the film, and it actually, I think, um, reached me a little deeper the second time. The first time it was all new to me, and uh, I kind of knew what to expect, but I was also s seeing it more. Um, for me, I found it very healing. There's um, a, a lot of uh, shame and failure. I brought my friends to work on this project, and it was a great and wonderful project but we failed. And I felt like I'd let my friends down by um, bringing them into this. And sort of seeing, uh, seeing the film, it reminded me both that we had a lot of fun while we were doing it, and there are repercussions of what we did. The ideas were right, just the timing was wrong. It, it has affected the world in a big way. Mark's ideas were way ahead of his time. And um, I'm really glad that I followed his ideas and brought my friends in. Great. Good. Thanks, Bill. And, and Andy, um, there was a lot of commentary in the film about the technical landscape uh, and the way things were at that moment in time. And I think people um, noticed the, the benefits that sprang forth from some of the invention, USB, touch screens, things that Megan worked on as well. Is there anything, you know, that, I mean, there was no Wi-Fi, right? Is, you know, Scully was pretty clear, clearly analog cell phone networks, et cetera. So what do you think the, um, what do you think led you to believe at that moment in time that all of it would come together? And, and what do you think today when you look back on it 20 plus years later in terms of where we are today? <laughs> well, watching the film, uh, the, the main thing that strikes me is just the team, the people, was uh, the most profound thing about it. We, we put together uh, an amazing team. Yeah. And uh, we loved each other, you know, we, it's, it's kind of like a family. I had that experience with the Mac team too, uh, many of which I, I see in the audience. Uh, and we believed in each, each other. Um, uh, the technical stuff, uh, you know, we knew about Moore's Law. We knew it would get better and better and better. We just had to establish the platform and stick with it. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, due to a lot of different things, we, we couldn't stick with it, and it, and it fell. Yeah. That sort of leads me to Mark in terms of the broader business model, because I think at that moment in time, it was really an amazing feat to bring such an incredible collection of large corporations, each of whom had you know, definitive technologies in their own space, and to try and coalesce that. I mean, that's the challenge. I guess maybe I should have asked you that first and then have Andy, Andy pile on and Megan pile on to that. But what was, what was kind of the, the thing that brought it together? I mean, how did you get them all in the room together? <laughs> The extraordinary, <clears throat> thank you, Dan, the extraordinary thing that, of, of being with the CEOs or the heads of these companies is that they saw, as Noria Uga said, they saw it also. Mm -hmm. So that the, I think the attribute of a great, you know, of, of a vision that is working uh, is that it's latent. It's just below the surface for the people who, uh, who, who feel it and touch it. And that's why I think Andy and Bill joined right away. It wasn't that I gave them this idea. It was, a, right. it was, it was in the air. It was in the, it was in the, they could smell it. They could taste it. And I just put some words around it that, that they said, that's it. And I think that was exactly the same thing with the 16 uh, founding partners. Yeah. And they were blood enemies. I mean, absolutely. You know, Panasonic, Matsushita, and Sony yeah. uh, could not sit in the same room. And Mike Stern uh, had to read before every founding partner's council meeting uh, here at the Fairmont in San Jose, he had to read an antitrust statement basically saying, you guys have like a shitload of market power and don't abuse it. Yeah. Don't be talking prices and don't be talking market allocation because that's what they actually needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was, a, it, was, it was tough. And they all needed to do it secretly from each other. But 
But back to this thing of vision, I think that it's kind of buried in your question and also in, uh, in, in what a Andy was saying. If you have a, a vision that feels like a sort of a bright, hot white light, and there it is, and you hold it steady, and, you, and, and people see it, all you need at that point to do is to get some uh, folks like this, heat-seeking missiles. Yeah. You know, they have their own avionics, and they see that, they see that missile, and they go right, I mean, they, that light, and they go right for it. Yeah. And if you can hold it steady, now the art is holding it steady. Yeah. Because it's, it, it, it won't hold. It, 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 it gets sh shaken up by other realities, and people want to douse it and break it and so on. But, but that's, I think, the key to what Andy and Bill were able to do in attracting that kind of talent. Yeah. was one person handing the vision and in, 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 in sort of lighting up the next person. And that was equally true of the founding partners. AT&T came first, right? And no. No. Sony? No, uh, it was, yeah, to, to sort of well, walk Apple, us through Apple that a little bit. Apple first, and then well, Sony and Motorola, okay. then at and The devices first. So still, I want, how did you get them in the room together? <laughs> <laughs> you still hung up on it. Well, I wish you'd been there with me. Yeah. You? <laughs> Uh, so John was the CEO of Apple. He begat uh, George Fisher, who was the CEO chairman right. of Motorola, who then begat uh, uh, Norio Oga, who was president of Sony. And from there, we went to AT&T and, and, and then you ran, ran the table. Uh, the three bears. The three bears. That was, <laughs> rawr, that was in the film. And, um, and uh, then we sort of ran, ran the table on telecommunications companies with France Telecom. And, NTT. It was all done at the high level, high, highest levels of the company. Yeah. Because if it if it went into the bowels of the company, yeah. it would be it would be stifled for sure. Stifled. Yeah. And it was it was yeah it was the clarity of the idea and the genesis of it, but also the guys you know the people that were in the team. Yeah. Megan was there. I mean, was yeah. I was going to ask you, Megan. One of the things that I once had an assignment, <laughs> I think we had two weeks, and I had to get a meeting for these three. Uh, I was going to. Um, with, the high, with the CEO of 14 Japanese companies, um, you know, just cold call. So we, they're so, it, it's such an amazing thing that, like you said, the vision that was held, what you guys had accomplished at Apple, um, and what you had done before, that this team was there. So people wanted to have that meeting. And so we were able to maybe use, as you said, like from John Scully to the connections that we had and then go in again, what you said, at the highest level because they saw the vision too. And, and as a young person, I was what, about 23, having also to jump that high. Yeah, Just really. a simple thing, but a really hard thing to really. do that kind of work. And then the way that we did those meetings was really beautiful. Like um, Bill would do these incredible demos of the software that would blow people's minds. Mark, really, you were able to communicate what what we all have when none of us knew what that might be in that way. You know, Andy, you weren't on that one trip, but then later also, and with the hand, handheld phone. It really, um, it was there and people could see it. And people wanted those meetings. Is it, with hindsight, is there anything you would have done differently when you, when you had them all in the room? Many, many, many things. <laughs> What do you have in mind the there? <laughs> I, I mean, because um, I mean, I, I know how complicated that is. I'm just because it's amazing to me it, when I watch it. It's that. more about them. You know, they saw it. They saw it, and they're living in hierarchical companies. Mike knows this very well. Matsushita had to have 13 signatures. Right. Starting with the, the lowest person, and we were just cranking right through that list, and then one, then it got stalled because one of the executives was on a vacation in Hawaii. And they needed consensus. Because they moved paper around and they had chops and, and they the had every CEO, piece of paper with. Exactly. exactly. And the CEO, to his credit, just right. banged it. But again, it's to their credit that they saw, they saw it. They knew it. They felt the authenticity and the talent, the depth of talent, and the commitment, and the teamwork. They saw what we were authentically, which is a, an awesome team. Yeah. And they said, I want part of that. Yeah. Because they saw it also. Yeah. It just I mean, that's how I want everybody to really understand that, how hard that is. That's why I keep pushing out, because <laughs> it's so hard it's to hard. do that, yeah, okay. especially then. I mean, the processes inside of these large electronics companies yeah. in Japan are very but difficult. For the business, the business nerds in, in the audience, it was, an, it was a, what, Andy and, what, what the team did yeah. was a reference platform. 
Yeah. Hardware. So, so it was, it was kind of like a Microsoft model in that sense, sure. Windows. So we, we felt that if we were able to simply get that out there and everyone signed up, right. except Microsoft and IBM, sure. um, it would become a de facto global standard right. without having to go to standards right. meetings. Right. So inadvertently, in we created our own nightmare, right. a standards meeting of, of big bears. We had, we had experienced the uh, Betamax versus VHS fiasco. Right. Where Consumers bought a better product from Sony and then found out they couldn't rent videos at the video store. Right. And uh, we wanted something more like the compact disc where it didn't matter which brand of player you bought, all of CDs would, would play in them all. Right. So we wanted interoperability. So what we had to make was a reference platform and uh, a suite of test software to validate each different company's teletouch Right. each uh, so, so that they were uh, follow the standards. So they would be interoperable. If you send a telecard from one, you should be able to receive it on another one from another brand. Right. Mark, are there any untold stories that relate to the coalition that you brought together oh. that you would like to maybe share with the audience? Oh, watch out. This is what <laughs> you can get sued. You want something. <laughs> I know you want something. It's either sex or violence, one or the other. So, uh, <laughs> So how do, we, how do we close Motorola? We close Motorola, um, uh, George Fisher, the CEO, yes. closed it. I was there in uh, Tokyo with a person who actually had to do the deal. He was not going to do the deal because he thought it was stupid. Okay. And, uh, and we got a lot of that. So uh, we were in Tokyo, and I decided to take him to an onsen, to a hot spring. There was a black water at 111 degrees. I mean, something terrible. And uh, we... Um, and we drank, uh, he drank, I didn't drink, uh, a lot of sake. Mm -hmm. And he was an English fellow, so he turned, you know, so he was already fair skinned. We put him in the, uh, in the onsen and he turned bright lobster color. <laughs> and he was woozy and he saw people there with tattoos all over their backs and missing fingers, or the Yakuza. The whole thing was very surreal to him and took him out and he was dizzy and we signed the deal. <laughs> I never heard this one. <laughs> didn't know that one. <laughs> that was fun. That's a good one. Um, that was in Roppongi. <laughs> Michael, um, you uh, played a really important role in structuring all of this. Were there any untold stories about how the structure evolved over time? Um, well, <clears throat> my favorite story is uh, doesn't involve the founding partners, but the other legal and <clears throat> political constraints that we faced. This is the 90s. The Japanese are taking over the American DRAM and semiconductor industry. We had to go through a CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US process, every time because we had offshore investors. And we were getting this incredibly tight scrutiny from Washington. And the, it, within a week after our public announcement of the devices in 1993, I got a subpoena from the Justice Department uh, because we had, we had competitors in this sitting around the table. They obviously conspiring to divide markets and fix prices. And so we spent two years shipping box, box cars of documents uh, to Washington and we had to convince them they were wrong before we could go public and we finally did. Um, so th it wasn't just, um, business, it was politics, and global politics, global trade politics. Yeah. And the final one is, um, you know, the guys from Fort Meade, many of you in the audience have probably met them. Um, they're the guys, with, they have their name on the card, but nothing else. It's just black with white letter. Um, so they came to visit us uh, when we applied for our export license. Again, another part of the global uh, trade and political system. And they said they needed to do a code review and make sure that they would be able to crack our devices. Either that or there had to be a back door. I assumed they had seen my FBI file. You know, I did jail time in the 60s uh, for anti-war work, and they knew who they were talking to, and I was really torn between being a patriot, being a radical, an ex-radical, and thinking the shareholders would shoot me if I said no, and they wouldn't let us ship. So we cooperated. <laughs> Incredible. 
Yeah. Megan, I want to ask you, what, what drew you to the company? I mean, you were 23, I think you said at the time. Yeah, 23. So how did that happen? How did you end up? I met Bill uh, in Japan. I worked right after I was in the Media Lab as a uh -huh. graduate student, and uh, I ended up going to Tokyo to work for Apple. And I met Bill because uh, we actually took over all of NHK one day um, for Hypermedia Day, and you opened it with a Buddhist monk with HyperCard. And so we just became friends. And I don't know, you said to me, hey, we should work together someday. And then as General Magic came together, um, you know, you guys came to demo, I think, and uh, was the first time that I met Mark, and I decided to, you guys to come and join, and I did. And I uh, got off the plane, and uh, what's nice is when you leave Japan, you leave before you leave, and then you get here in the morning, so you leave at 5, and then the next, it's the same day, and it's 9, and I went straight to work. <laughs> <laughs> I was very happy to do that. Yes. Meg yeah. Megan and Tony were our, our babies. We, you know, we nurtured them along. They didn't, sure. They didn't know much. Actually, she'd already gotten an MIT uh, engineering degree, so you know, she wasn't exactly a baby. But oh no. But we were learning so much, and, and one of the things that you know, not represented in us right here, uh, but people like Wendell Sanders, Brian Sanders, Walt, uh, Tony's part of this, the Amy uh, Lindbergh, the whole hardware team is also an astonishing group. Sure. Um, Wendell had worked at Fairchild, uh, you know, and then all the way to you know, the beginning of Apple, and then his son Brian was uh, sure. later, not only were they together at General Magic, but also Brian was at Apple with the iPod team. So between, uh, for Bre Brian and Wendell, they've probably had a chip in almost every Apple product ever, and then Amy, of course, was part of that chip team too. Yes, so yes. just, I got to work in that team, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I was working, you saw, on touch screens and LCDs and kind of the physical device side of things, and was lucky to join. Yeah, I mean, that's such early, early, early stuff. It's just fascinating. What lesson did you walk away with that you've applied in sort of on an ongoing basis? I think from all of these experiences, everyone, I'm going to ask each of you a little bit about this. Um, you know, what, in your next endeavor, you always, I mean, Tony waxed poetically about that in mm -hmm. so many different ways in, in, the, in the film, but each of you didn't have a chance to sort of uh, reflect on that. So these deep experiences, years and years of your lives, what, what was the takeaway for your next endeavor and then how did you build on it over time? And in particular, you, Megan, going all the way to the White House and, and uh, you know, just the scale of, of the problem space because mm -hmm. you were attacking a really big problem at a really young age and then there you are some number of years later sitting you know, in the White House helping the government and all of the political leaders think about technology at mm -hmm. scale. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, Silicon Valley, we're really so much uh, apprentice journey mastery. This is a place where we come and we learn from those ahead of us, uh, and it hands down in such an incredible way. And if you're lucky enough to work with folks like this, you learn a lot. I think, you know, Mike, um, between you and Mark and others, I learned all of business school, you know, for myself of learning how to do deals and how to do partnerships and how to actually communicate with people. And uh, Bill and Andy, I think, you know, really how to make a product. I remember Andy um, taking the models and clicking it together and saying, okay, make sure you remember we've got to have the camera because people are going to take pictures and send them all over the world. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and that was like 1992 and, you know, here we are. Um, so I think it's, it's that you know, Jane Anderson is here, like learning yeah. how to communicate with the world, you know, every single thing. So each of my mentors, and I think those who are the luckiest in Silicon Valley and around any kind of industry get that apprentice journey mastery um, opportunity to work with extraordinary colleagues. The other thing we all noticed um, when we saw it the, the, the first time was I noticed, I think kindness is as important as knowledge and, and the intensity and the kindness that was in this team that sometimes this seems to be absent in some other teams um, around the, the valley. It, it's very important, um, and uh, so I try to take that forward. Um, and then in, in terms of like now, I think the thing that we were trying to do, what this device was about, the things you saw, is sort of everybody has talent in them. You know, and how are we using this device and this network that really actually isn't about this, it's about all of us. Hmm. And how are all of us connected? And how are each of us going to bring, like, how are we 7 billion plus colleagues, right? And how do we think about all the problems in the world that are out there? I'm, I'm so excited because on Thursday I'm going to be in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and then uh, on Sunday and Monday uh, in Standing Rock. And we're working with entrepreneurs that through MIT we just asked the Standing Rock and the Lakota, uh, Shadi Shakona people, who's got amazing things you want to work on? 
And uh, we got 22 proposals of extraordinary things people want to do in energy and housing and, and just solving poverty with technical and scientific and other kinds of uh, disciplines. And so we're going to come up underneath them in the way that venture capitalists come up underneath a Bezos or a Zuckerberg and solve some of the greater challenges there because people have what's needed in them. Mm -hmm. And that's what General Magic is about, is about magic that's in everybody and using these devices and these networks for the good it could be and being really careful now that we see how the Russians and others are weaponizing it to then again step up again together and bring it back to what humanity can be. So that's, I think, the lessons that I learned from those who went before and those who are still here with me. You know? Yeah, no, I think that's well said. The scale at which the problem space is developed is global. Mm -hmm. um, the geopolitical boundaries are real. Um, the nation state actors are real. Um, yeah, and are we going to have a surveillance society that's very crushing and we go into sort of Handmaid's Tale and all this right, nightmare? Right. Or are we going to go into right. the beauty of what sort of the summer of love and all this kind of stuff that this world has kind of grown out of? You know, that's why we're here in this San Francisco kind yeah. of valley way. And I'm so pleased that you're all here at the Computer History Museum because I think the forward-looking opportunity for all of us, and you all in particular, given your experiences, is to, to share that context with the next generation. Um, there are you know, billions of people that use, quote unquote, computing devices, but we all grew up you know, with files that you open and save and things like that, and there's a huge percentage of the world that, that really doesn't use a computer in that way. Uh, and it's about, it's about the data, and it's about the implications, it's about the environment and all the other things. So others uh, here, lessons, um, you know, Mark, for you, I mean, you, you were able to, to talk a little bit on film, but you know, anything different as you watch the film that comes to mind? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so watching the film, as you can imagine, was, uh, yeah. was hard. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, the way I experienced, the, the way I experienced it and what I w would say is that you are here, and we on the stage are, um, are the kinds of people who want to, and in some sense need to, are compelled to give it all. That's just the nature of who you are, and, uh, and your friends. And, and, and because when you do that, when we do that, and we're driven by something that's extremely passionate in our, in our view, we feel that it's something important. It's something that gives purpose. It's something that gives direction. As a human being, we want to give it all. Yeah. And by giving it all, and you, you have all experienced this, and you enter kind of a, a state of flux that you feel when you're programming or when you're painting or when you're doing anything that is at that level of peak performance. And that's where you want to be. Mm -hmm. The paradox is you don't want to be there all the time right. because you get emptied out. You get hollowed out uh, in places that are essential to be able to continue being, you know, hum or humanity. Your, right. your position as a husband or a father or, or, or in, you know, any any relationship that matters. So the paradox, I haven't solved it necessarily, sure. is give it all because that's the state of being that is that is transcendental. And don't give it all. Save some, because whether you fail or whether you succeed, you will need that something inside you to, to pull through. Yeah. Um, uh, failure creates aberrations. Success creates aberrations. Neither is any good. <laughs> and to stay centered and to stay human, to stay in that zone of goodness, it, you have to save, you have to hold back. Yeah. One more thing, if I might. Feel. Yeah, so there's a paradox. There's also an illusion. And the illusion is that if you give it all, if, if you have an idea and you just absolutely slam on it and don't save anything, it addresses the insecurity of what if you are that little choo-choo train is, it, is coming to the top and is it going to make it I over can. the top? I think I, I, think I can. can, exactly. If you make it over the top, it's because you gave it all. Yeah. If it doesn't get over the top, it's because you didn't give it all. That's an illusion. Yeah. That's an illusion. And I think huh. what I learned is that, in fact, by backing off and and, and going more slowly and taking more time, I mean, not in the context of that taking more time, it's yeah. a little bit, but just being more quiet and, and present and, and engaged in what you're doing rather than flat out crazy, 
right? Which is the ethos of Silicon Valley. It's flat out crazy and loving it, 90 hours. You actually go faster. And you, and you, and you come out the other side a better person yeah. with a better product and a better business and so on. Yeah. That's my that's my. Now, that's a wonderful statement mm. you just made. I think it's um, felt by everyone in the room. So, Bill? When I was so uh, working on HyperCard back at Apple, I thought what our planet needed was wisdom. And uh, really what General Magic was about, um, one of the core ideas was these little telecards. You could send a little message to your friend and it'd show up in their pocket. And I still think that's very important. But what I think that the planet really needs now is compassion. We have um, isolated groups that are kind of like really made more divisive. Our, 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 our Facebook has made us cut into little islands of separateness that are fighting each other. And, and the worst, it's drawing out the worst properties in people. And um, in some ways, our devices are, are, are making us less human and, and more mm, mean. And so I think what I would like to see, the proper use of our technologies, mm -hmm. is, is some way to uh, connect us in a way where we feel compassion for other people yeah. and less uh, isolated islands. Yeah, there's one argument that's uh, abound, which is more tied to the business models as opposed to the devices of the technology, because we're basically selling, auctioning off attention of clusters. And, and um, you know, if you read Tim Wu's book about the attention merchants and you know, the focusing of mass populations, um, it's, it's, it's really complicated. And I think as a society, you, know, you all were coalescing all of the components, <clears throat> Mark's vision, I'm going to waive this because about two weeks before I, I took this job here at the Computer History Museum, I was going through all my old artifacts and I found this, which is the general magic introduction document <laughs> that Mark hadn't seen since the introduction. And so I read it before coming on board here and, uh, and doing this interview. And, and you know, I hadn't seen the movie until tonight. But the stage setting, the presence, the coalition of actors that came to the table, um, this will become an archive here at the museum. You can all take a look at it. Uh, I don't know that there are any others that exist, but it's dated February 10th, 1993, and it's got my name on it. So I was pretty happy to find it. <laughs> and this, this, for me, I just want to want to thank you for that because it, it, I think what you said, Bill, is really true. Everyone in the room is undoubtedly struggling with it personally, with their community, with their friends, with their children, with their everyone. And so others have similar context about you know, lessons learned or the surprises that you have experienced since 1995 to today with the way things have come together. You know, Bill, you comment about the implications on humanness and others. Any surprises, technical surprises or personal emotional issues? The IP. Uh, oh, well. Well, I don't want to talk about that, but uh, <laughs> it's a long story. I, I actually tried to buy the General Magic uh, intellectual property, but Nathan Mirvold uh, swooped in at the yeah, last minute. Yeah, huh? after, 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 after we, we uh, won it at auction twice, we, we lost it. But oh, my. What I wanted to say to answer your question is one Why of the things. Why do people like that do that? Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, one of the things Steve Jobs used to tell us when we were working on the Mac was a, an old Zen aphorism, the journey is yes, the reward. reward. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's one of the big lessons is, is uh, enjoy the time developing it uh, because time is fleeting. Yeah, it is. That's the context for all. Yeah, I mean, I think the Valley's technological utopianism, it sense that by creating tools that democratize access to information, and creativity, um, that you can make the world a better place, you can change the world, our cliche, um, is, um, occludes some of the costs of technological development and some of the social costs of having devices like the ones we were trying to create. And so what it comes down to, it's um, you can't create a magic device that changes the world. You have to, you, giving people tools only works if you then work with the people. Mm. And that's what goes to what Bill is saying. That's what we're missing now. We're missing the notion that politics is about the hard work of persuasion and uh, 
motivation. And tools don't do that. They help you get there, but we have to do it ourselves. And that's what I've learned over the years, yeah. that a magic device is not enough. Right. We have to do it ourselves. Right. You know, um, yeah, general magic is really, as you say, about the magic of us. You know, and uh, one, one thing that I think, we're just looking downstairs at the Ada Lovelace papers. Do you guys um, know that Ada Lovelace's papers are in this building right now, which is incredible. Um, one of the things that she said in, uh, in the 1840s, maybe, around, this, around the time Darwin wrote, I don't know if you know Ada, she's the person who invented computer science, wrote about it first. Um, she said, I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. So the invention of AI, and if you read, you know, she thinks that, she writes about how she thinks we should be able to figure out the mathematics of the cerebrum, just like we have of the planets, um, meaning astronomy, meaning AI. So she's there, and the fact that we erased her is a real problem. And Mike and I went through this, you know, you sent men patents. I got erased from a general magic patent, and we couldn't ever figure out why. And I think that the fact that we erased women. It was Tony's women, fault. You know, it just <laughs> happens. It happens not because individually, but it happens. Um, Tony did do it, but accidentally. Um, <laughs> it was the USB one. I'm a co-inventor. Uh, so why are we erasing women and people of color from the story? And, and that allows us to write stuff like the Google memo, right? That, that crazy memo that whatever that guy's name was. Um, it's, it's misunderstanding, and it's interesting. I bring it up because we're in the Computer History Museum. So we have to do the job to tell the whole story. And when the Mac stories used to come out and we'd watch the movies, I remember watching, and I'm like, where's Susan? And, where? and Joanna finally is in there. And I was like, but, but it's Bill and Andy and Susan and Joanna, and it's men and women working together. And it was always that way, and that's what we learned from you all. And then when it went to Hollywood, they disappeared or maybe Joanna a little bit, but she's kind of treated as a mom a little bit in, in the film and miswritten. So it's important, um, I, and I and maybe go a little long form on it because um, the further back you can look, the further forward you will see is what Churchill said. And it, it was a, a set of work that we did with President Obama called Image of STEM. It's 15 to one boy programmers to girl programmers in children's television. So we're sort of miscommunicating and it matters because what we think this stuff is for is what any of us all together think of what it's is for. And Ada wanted us to use AI to help ourselves. And then Turing thinks we should imitate. So is Ada Ray from Star, Star Wars and maybe Kylo Ren is Turing? <laughs> you know, I don't know, but we got to have a conversation about it. And we got to know, no. do we really want AI? You know, I remember my colleague Sundar was demoing the AI was calling to make an appointment for a haircut, right? Do I want a fake thing to call me and trick me? Or do I want it to say, hi, I'm Mike's robot calling for this? Why are we not being transparent? about that and who does, made those design choices and why is it on the great phone that Andy saw that if I take a picture of a white person, it load balances, color balances perfectly, but if I take a picture of a person of color, I have to take an extra step to adjust it? This camera's racist. So <laughs> what, it is, you know, so what are we doing? It's a software, I think. <laughs> right. So what are we doing to make sure that people of color, women, that all 7 billion people are included and not just one group of people has the power tools and the venture capital and the voice? You know, Ada, Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass protested the Chicago World's Fair when Tesla was all that, right? Because they weren't allowed to exhibit as African-American people and the same thing happened on the CES stage this year. So let's stop doing that. And so it's, it's really important to do that. And so I think that's also in general magic. It's all of us. That's wonderful. That, that's a terrific statement. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask one last question, uh, just a quick one down the line about, was there a particular, just a moment, high or low, from the, fr from the whole experience? You just watched the movie. Is there, was there a particular moment? Maybe we'll start with you, Michael, and put you on the spot. Um, it was finding out that everyone who had bought the device was someone I knew personally. <laughs> um, AT&T's uh, royalty report showed us the names of the subscribers, and uh, it was really disheartening to think that we had had that small a footprint. <laughs> Good. How about you, Bill? 
Let me think about it a little. Come back. Okay. Uh, every time I watch the film, it's a different answer. Would be a different answer. But this time, it was uh, the most poignant moment for me was uh, when my daughter Liana and I were sitting in front of my car, car. Yeah. Uh, touching, and it was and and that's the reality. Yeah. That's fundamental. You know, I, I now have a um, a three and a half year old girl and, yep. and, a, and two eight-month-old kids. That's, that's a profound act of optimism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that's, the, that's what a child does. Good for you. It grounds you and centers you. And at the end of the day, it's for, the, it's for them. You know, it's we're leaving them a world that is uh, really difficult, where you have to manufacture your own persona that's yeah. fake and so on. It's, 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 a, it's a, a world of you know, yep. climate change issues. And so it's for them. And the kids will grow up. They will be better than we are. They will invent things that are much more awesome. Megan was a baby when she joined General Magic. Now she's <laughs> turned out to be a pretty good woman, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> so I think a sense of optimism. That's what terrific. Else? Good. Anyone, anyone else? Hey, Bill? Yeah. Um, I had kind of a tickle when I saw sending a telecard um, because I. I still send postcards for people. Yeah. I, I print and mail custom postcards with my PhotoCard app, yep. which is a descendant of the Magic App software. And I, I still do that. And in my retirement, that's the one thing I keep doing. And a lot of people send cards, and I print and mail them for them. Um, and yeah. so when I saw somebody sending a telecard, I thought, you know, that was the core idea. What, I, I know John Warnock was on our board, and he said, this thing with the telecard dropping out of the sky, that's a fresh new idea arose. Remember, this is before text messages. I do. <laughs> and very few people were using email even there at you that go. time. And uh, he said, this is a fresh new idea. But then we sort of surrounded it with a whole lot of other functions because the devices were expensive. They sure. had to do more. They had to do more. And it became a bouquet with a rose in the middle. Yeah. But we couldn't just send, we couldn't sell a telecard transceiver because that would have had to be, you know, $50 so each person in a family could have one. And it wasn't possible at that time to do that. Right. So when I saw the telecard being sent, that reminded me that it was a lot of, you know, the idea that we wanted. Ah, I got a telecard from Dad. There you go. Andy, can one I, thing? Can I add one thing, Dan? I sure. But it, it goes to, movies are about choice, making movies about making choices. The other, th it's about something that's not in the movie, but it goes very much to what Mark was saying. Um, that party footage where people were trying to get the balloons to go up to the sky oh. with their lighters and stuff. Um, each member, each the, the spouse or partner and the children of each member of the management team was filmed by David Hoffman at that party. And we were going through the archival stuff and every single spouse said, will you hurry up and get the goddamn thing done <laughs> and come home? <laughs> And the kids all said, where is mommy or where is daddy? And we chose not to use it, partly because it was too long. But it, it goes to the, the price of what we were trying to accomplish. That was real, too. There you go. So and I, again, I think of what we didn't do, what we didn't use also when I watched the there film. There you go. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's all good, Ann. <laughs> oh, the biggest pang I get when I see the film is when I see uh, amazing people like uh, Phil Goldman, Zarko Draganik, uh, died way before they should have, and it just really tugs at my heart. I see that, for sure. And Megan? Yeah, I thought the same. Yeah, yeah I was going to say the same thing. I mean, the, the scene of Zarko yeah. uh, late at night, because I would go into his right. cube all the time and right. just see him in that. He was an amazing person, and so we missed them. Before we close up, I would be remiss if I didn't, um, on behalf of Marguerite, who runs the Exponential Center, from which we're, we're bringing this event to everyone today, she asks and we ask each of you to um, surface one word that you would use to communicate to some next generation entrepreneur. One word. Megan. Kindness. Kindness. I said, they asked us to, this uh, before the thing, and I said, uh, perseverance. Um. Mark, you're going you're gonna to go last. I need to go last. There you go. User testing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, that's a home run. <laughs> <laughs> Two words, but right. Um, hyphen, hyphen. hyphen. <laughs> uh, mine was focus. Focus, there you go. And Mark? Mine needs explaining, unfortunately. G-force, which is those incredible forces you have to endure when you're doing a startup. There you go. So. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>